Thanks for watching this clip from my new podcast, In Search of Soil. For more great clips and full episodes, check out the links in the description below. So for somebody at home who wants to start, what's a basic recipe for compost tea? I have a bucket, I have water, I have a bubbler, I have some good quality compost. Do I need anything else? Um, so in any presentation, not the cheapest way you can make compost tea, you can get a bucket for free even by going to the bakery section at a grocery store and get a three to five gallon bucket. You go to a paint store, you get a two to three dollar paint strainer bag. That's a five gallon bag. It has an elastic top. It fits perfectly on a bucket. It's extremely, it's like made for brewing. Um, the most you're going to spend is on like a 20 to $40 aquarium pump. That's going to pump air into there and then compost. So with my, my quality of compost, I use, uh, three to five cups per five gallon brew. I'm normally more on the three, three cup side. It, it, you really don't need much. And then, you know, you could do just an extract and get results from that, not add any foods, but if you want to add foods, so there's bacterial foods and there's fungal foods. The really the only bacterial food that I recommend or that Elaine talks about is unsulfured blackstrap molasses, which is something that you can get at the grocery store. Um, then fungal foods, there are different things. The main ones that I like to use are humic acid, fish hydrolysate, and then I like to either use feather meal or kelp meal or soluble kelp. And in a five gallon brew, I'll use a tablespoon of humic acid, possibly two, but I don't go more than that. And a tablespoon of fish hydrolysate and a tablespoon of kelp. So like I'm not doing more than three tablespoons altogether in the whole thing for five gallons. You really, it just really needs to keep it minimal. Um, because you're working with microorganisms that are tiny, you know, like they don't need a ton of food. Most people think that more is better, but not in this case. So minimal foods. So yeah, a tablespoon humic acid, tablespoon fish hydrolysate, tablespoon kelp or um, feather meal. And then if I were to use a bacterial food, the unsulfur blackstrap molasses, I would only put like half to one teaspoon in a five gallon bucket. And normally you've got enough, the fish hydrolysate is going to also be food for bacteria. And we've normally got enough bacteria going in our compost that we don't really need to get that going that much more because we're trying to get other microorganisms going more. Uh, and then I've got a, a table that's a rule of thumb that I put together on brew time. So brew time for a compost tea really is dependent on the ambient temperature outside, which has a, an effect on the oxygen in the air as well. So in the springtime in March and April, when I've got cooler temps and uh, it's getting down to 35, 45 at night, but then in the daytime, it's getting up to 65, 70 degrees, I'm brewing for two and a half to three days to get to peak population. In the summertime, it's a lot hotter. The microorganisms are more active anyway. Uh, it will take, you know, in the middle of the summer, I don't normally brew in the middle of the summer, but uh, in the beginning of summer, say, it's only going to take, you know, if it's uh, 75 at night, 95 during the day, it's going to take only, you know, like 24 hours to brew. And because of that, you're, what I said, you're trying to get to a peak population. So the peak, the population of microorganisms are growing, growing, growing. You hit a peak population and then all of a sudden they've run out of food and they've used up all the air, even if you may have been oxygenating it and you quickly go anaerobic. And so it's a matter of hitting that peak population. And the problem that many people have is that they're brewing for too long and then you're getting those anaerobic microorganisms going. If you ever need to air, air on the side of brewing for too short. So if you think it's too hot out, brew for just a few hours. Like I said, that guy in Pennsylvania, we weren't even using foods, for we were using extracts. So we weren't increasing the populations. And, he, and that was five gallons per acre and he was getting results. So if you need to air, air on the side of, of being uh, 
not brewing long enough or what you think would be long enough. Is there a visual cue for brewing too long? There's not. Um, a lot of people... A lot of people think it's great to like see foam in compost tea. Like foam really doesn't have anything to do necessarily with microorganisms. Yes, they do create a little bit of foam through their reproduction, but not the kind of things that I see people on YouTube videos talking about. It's normally because you've got a thick substance like fish hydrolysate that's getting air pumped up through it. So like just when you're a little kid and blowing on milk, blowing in your glass of milk and creating bubbles, it's kind of that same thing. I The only thing that, the only cue that I have noticed is once you start to get this, the only way I can describe it is a wet straw smell. So it's kind of a, kind of a gross smell. If you've smelled straw that sat around wet, if you, once you start to hit that, um, I would say, uh, you're either at peaky population or you need to use it. Then if, um, there are, there are cues that, that it's gone bad if you smell anything bad. So uh, same thing with a compost pile. Your Our noses are meant to detect bad things and we can rely on our own devices. So if you smell something that is uh, very off-putting to you, it's gonna be off-putting to the microorganisms, especially because they're a lot more sensitive than we are. So in a compost tea, if you smell like a manure smell, it's definitely gone anaerobic and you probably don't want to use it. Um, another thing I do need to mention is that compost tea is made with compost. If you put soil and because people get this idea, oh, I need a fungal dominant brew. So they'll take what they know is fungal dominant soil and put it in your brew. And I can't say I haven't done that. Yes, I have. But you're taking the chance that there might be a pest or disease in that soil that hasn't gone through the composting process. Um, you, you're using pathogens into your booth. So in that same sense, uh, I believe it was Penn State that did, I think it was in the 90s, it was either in the 90s or early 2000s, and that did compost tea experiments and research, but they were using manure. Manure is not compost, manure is manure. So they were making manure tea and breeding E. coli and stuff like that. So, so these people who are introducing bat guanos and stuff like that, I'm not necessarily saying you're going to get bad stuff, but that's not necessarily a strictly compost tea. Compost tea is using compost. And um, I apologize, but I meant to touch on this briefly way back in the conversation, but you had mentioned cold composting. I just want to mention this real quick. The reason that we want to get up to temperature on a compost pile and go through what are called PFRPs, practices, practices that reduce pathogens, um, is because those hot temperatures kill pathogens and weed seeds. And so that's the benefit of having a hot composting process is because we're hopefully killing all the pathogens and weed seeds that are in that. In that same sense with the smell, if you've got a compost pile that you smell ammonia, you're losing your nitrogen in the form, your, the nitrogen that's in, not all the nitrogen, but the nitrogen or the stuff that you smell, you're losing so much of that nitrogen as a gas form of ammonia. And so the nitrogen that you should be keeping in your product is getting lost in a gaseous form as well as that compost is going anaerobic. Or if you get like a sulfur smell, that's also going to be, um, I can't think of the, uh, the nutrient that it is, but that you're, you're losing that nutrient in a gaseous form. So anytime you smell something bad, you're not only losing nutrients, your pile has gone anaerobic and you need to get air immediately into there. Thanks for watching this clip from my new podcast in search of soil. For more great clips and full episodes, check out the links in the description below.